Well, thank you very much. This is Ike Ahmed from the University of Toronto. It's my pleasure to moderate the session on Micropulse Laser Trabeculoplasty uh, with kind support from Iridex and BMC for running the webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers shortly. And my job here is to moderate this session uh, on uh, new technology, Micropulse Laser Trabeculoplasty. Now, when we talk about uh, glaucoma therapy, I like, to think, I like to think of glaucoma as moving into an interventional type of disease. And uh, this slide kind of describes where we're at with some of these technologies. As we've seen over the last few years, glaucoma therapy has moved more into an interventional type of therapy. I think we're uh, reconsidering the paradigm shifts in terms of managing glaucoma and with the introduction of, uh, for example, microbasal glaucoma surgery and other laser technologies, it's given us consideration of what exactly is medically, uh, maximally tolerated medical therapy. And this has led to the term interventional glaucoma, uh, an idea that glaucoma may be best treated by uh, non-medication alternatives, including laser trabeculoplasty microinvasive glaucoma surgery and surgery in general. And so laser trabeculoplasty has been, of course, uh, an option for our patients for many years now. I think we're, we're currently and we're continuing to reconsider where its place is, and I hope this uh, discussion will further uh, add options and ideas around this therapy. Now, one thing before we get into our discussion um, by our two speakers, I think is worth highlighting is what is micropulse? And I think as uh, ophthalmologists, as cataract surgeons, it's a term that we're familiar with, of course, with fake emulsification. And those of you that are familiar with aesthetic lasers, whether it's skin or hair removal, of course, have also heard the term micropulse. And the idea here is basically to use the advantages of conventional laser therapy, i.e. continuous wave, and break up the continuous wave into very small, discrete micropulses. And this allows basically energy to be delivered, but a cooling period in between that energy delivery to allow a reduction in thermal buildup. Essentially, this allows the tissue to attain a cooling factor to prevent collateral damage. And as you can see from the pictures on the right, essentially, laser energy can be divided up into different uh, methods, whether it's a high, medium, or low duty cycle. So basically, the idea here, essentially, is to uh, attain the effect of the laser without some of the damage that occurs from laser therapy. Now, we've seen micropulse in action uh, with retinal laser therapy, and this diagram nicely shows some of the difference in action now with conventional laser therapy. We typically get a laser burn. In, in that area of, of, of the burn therapy and the collateral damage, there's really very little um, benefit in that laser burn, but the benefit is the collateral uh, biological action that occurs, whether it's inflammatory or other mediated actions that surround the laser itself. Uh, when we talk about uh, we talk about micropulse laser therapy, the idea again is essentially the laser application is made in a less traumatic way, and therefore the mediated action, in this case, for example, a biological mediated mediator mechanism, is attained within the actual apl apply site of action. And so there's much less collateral damage that can occur, and the idea here again being that we retain the action of the laser itself. Now to help us uh, with this discussion, we have two excellent speakers that uh, I'm very happy to be moderating with. And our first speaker uh, is David Gossage. Now, David Gossage is uh, the medical director at the Gossage Eye Institute in Hillsdale, uh, Michigan. He's a clinical associate professor of ophthalmology at Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan. And he has a major interest in teaching. In fact, he, uh, he teaches across the, uh, the continental U.S. Uh, and takes students from a variety of uh, campuses across uh, the country. Uh, he is very active uh, in residency teaching uh, at Michigan State University and is program director there of the residency program. And we have the advantage here of, of David being a comprehensive ophthalmologist, a lot of experience with different technologies, specifically with uh, microprose laser technology, not only with glaucoma, but also in retina as well. And uh, I've had a chance to hear some of his, uh, his talks and hear some, look at some of his data. And he's been out there now as far as having some early experience with this uh, technology, and I think we'll be able to add a lot of value uh, to understanding where this will fit uh, with our uh, glaucoma patients. So I'm happy to turn over the uh, microphone to uh, David, and thank you, David, for being part of this webinar. Thanks, Dr. Ahmed, for that great uh, presentation. I do want to thank Iridex for uh, their support for tonight's uh, program. Some of my goals for tonight is I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how we can use the micropulse for the anterior segment for treatment of glaucoma as well as the treatment of the posterior segment for conditions like diabetic macular edema or branch retinal vein occlusions, and how the IQ532 laser with micropulse is excellent choice for that of the comprehensive ophthalmologist now I use in my practice. When we look at a micropulse treated eye of the trabecular meshwork under electron microscopy, using 300 milliseconds and a 300 micron spot size and 1,000 milliwatts of power, we really don't see any change in that of the micropulse treated eye versus that of the control. And like Dr. Ahmed talked about uh, regarding the use of the laser and, and how the micropulse is segmented into um, small little boxes of treatment, 
we know that we don't develop the thermal effects that we'd see with a continuous wave laser. Therefore, we don't have the thermal destruction of the tissue, but we still have the mediators that are liberated to be able to create the treatment and desired effect that we want. So with laser trabeculoplasty, we use the laser energy to treat the trabecular meshwork, and this will increase the outflow facility. Now, our main indications for laser trabeculoplasty is that of patients with elevated intraocular pressure. Now, it's effective in treating the intraocular pressure, whether it's a patient with primary opening glaucoma, pigmentary glaucoma, or pseudoexfoliation glaucoma. Now, with the treatment of the laser, we really don't want to use uh, laser trabeculoplasty, whether it's SLT, ALT, or micropulse uh, laser trabeculoplasty for treatment of patients who have problems like eovascular glaucoma or uveitic glaucoma or have synechial closure or uh, peripheral anterior synechiae within their angle because this would be very difficult to, to treat and it would not respond. Now, initially, uh, we didn't really know what type of settings we should use for the treatment of micropulse uh, laser therapy, and I started off using 300 milliwatts of power. I currently looked at 13 eyes who are newly diagnosed with open anal glaucoma. Now, these patients elected to undergo micropulse laser therapy, and the mean IOP was 26 millimeters of mercury with a range of 21 to 38 millimeters of mercury. Now, none of these patients had any previous treatment. However, five of them did have ALT in the fellow eye. So initially, I used the IQ532 laser by Iridex, and I treated 360 degrees of continuous spots. Preoperatively, just because of previous experience with uh, argon laser trabeculoplasty, I used bromondine 0.15%, along with prednisolone assay of 1%. I also used a rich four-mirror lens for the treatment. Now, my treatment parameters at first was using the 300 micron spot size and a power setting of 300 milliwatts, the duration of 300 milliseconds, and a duty cycle of 15%, and treated 360 degrees. The slide on the, the right, the picture on the right, is actually a screenshot, which will show you all your parameters. So anytime you're concerned about what the size of the spot size is or the duration or power, it's easily seen on the uh, front console of the Iridex machine. At four months, we looked at our results. Initially, we had a preoperative IOP of 25.7 and a postoperative IOP of 21.1, or approximately an 18% reduction. We did have one patient who had uh, one millimeter rise in pressure, which was patient number 11, so they had a 5% increase in intraocular pressure following treatment. This patient actually underwent subsequent ALT, and with the ALT procedure, ended up with no change either. So. Whether this patient was going to be a, a laser non-responder or not, it's hard to say, but they had no response whether they had a traditional ALT with continuous wavelength laser 